Lesson number three, Women of Faith in the Scriptures. Today we are looking at Ruth, a Moabite, a Gentile. Last week we looked at Rahab, a Gentile. Next week we'll be looking at Esther. Rabbis in the Talmudic tradition, those of you who are not familiar with the Talmud, there are several teachings, that Ruth was daughter of Eglon, the king of Moab. Moabites came from the relationship between Lot and his daughter. The book of Ruth, verse 1, chapter 1, There came a time in the days of the judges when there was no food in the land. A certain man from Bethlehem, Judah, he and his wife and two sons, left to make a living in the country of Moab. His name was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi, They had two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, and they came to the country of Moab and continued there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took to themselves wives of Moab, Orpah and Ruth, Malon, the husband of Ruth, Chilion, the husband of Orpah, verse 5, also died. And the three women were left widows. Verse 6, Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return uh, from the country of Moab back to Bethlehem. For she had heard how the Lord had visited the land, giving them bread. The famine was over. Verse 7, wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws and went on their way to return to Judah. Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, Go return to your mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, and the Lord grant you that you might find rest, each of you, in the house of of a husband. She kissed them. They lifted up their voices, and they wept. They said unto her, Surely we will return with thee. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? There are no more sons in my womb that you might have husbands. Turn again, my daughters, and go your way. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and left. And her name, Orpah, actually comes from her turning her back on Naomi and returning home. But Ruth clave to Naomi, and she said, Behold, Naomi says, Thy sister has gone back. You return. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return, following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Whether thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death part you and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, Naomi left off speaking, and they returned to Bethlehem. The story of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. It was a time of spiritual darkness, rebellion, and foreign oppression in the land of Israel. Judges 21-25 summarizes that entire period and says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. A time when God's people acted like anything but God's people. Ruth, a Gentile, exemplifies faith and fidelity. Paul says in Romans, It is not familiarity with the law that justifies a man in the sight of God, but obedience to the law. When Gentiles who have no law or knowledge of the law act in accordance with the light of nature, they demonstrate the effect of the law operating on their own hearts. That's from J.B. Phillips. That entire chapter demonstrates to us that those who have no idea or concept of what God's word has to say can outperform those who carry the law. So carrying the law and knowing the word doesn't do much for you if you aren't living it. The background is a famine in Judea caused Naomi's husband, Elimelech, which means my God is king, to migrate to the land of the Moabites. Their two sons, Malon and Chilion, married two Moabite girls, Ruth and Orpah, I knew I'd say that. (laughs) After ten years, Elimelech and his two sons died. Naomi tells her childless daughter-in-laws to stay in Moab, find new husbands. But 
Ruth refuses. God's divine providence is seen in the lives of Naomi and Ruth. Through tragedy and triumph, God weaves a tapestry of redemption and grace. In these passages that I've read, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, when Naomi hears that the famine in Bethlehem has had subsided, she made plans to return home. She releases both her daughter-in-laws to find new husbands. Both girls resisted. Naomi insisted she believed God had turned his back on her and the girls. They would be better off to stay away from her. You ever felt that way? Yep. <laughs> you ever felt like God's frown was on you and the best thing that could happen to your family is for them not to be around you? Yep. Yep. <laughs> the devil will do that to all of us. Yes. But Ruth went, verses 15 through 17, back to her people and her gods. Many believe that the gods only held power in certain areas and regions during that day. Those who left Judah living in Moab, God could not bless them there because they weren't in Judah. These verses capture Ruth's loyalty to Naomi as she mentions the name of Jehovah in her comments. Your God, Jehovah, will be my God, Jehovah. This pledge reveals her devotion and her exceptional sterling character. Now we have a young lady who is presumed to have been raised in the court of the king. She has class. She has been taught to be a princess. She has character. She has strength. She has devotion, fidelity, loyalty, and faith. This young lady is exceptional. Verses 1 through 13 of chapter 2 we find a fellow by the name of Boaz, who is an honorable administrator. They happen to come back to Judah and to Bethlehem just at the time of the barley harvest, which is about April and May, which is about the same time as Pentecost. Ruth seeks permission from Naomi to volunteer to go into the fields to glean, as the poor people did, the poverty-stricken, to get the leftovers in the field so that they might be able to have some food. She asks Naomi, and then she goes to the workers of the field where she happens to go to and asks permission from them. She demonstrates humility and a submission and a willingness to perform menial tasks. Some people are too good to work. They look for it to be handed to them. They're not willing to go out and clean toilets, pick up trash, or do what is necessary to get along. Now notice that Jesus told his disciples, if you want to be the greatest among all of the brethren, you need to be the servant of everybody else. Jesus says this to you and to me. You want to be the leader? You need to be the servant. He said, I came not to be served. Jesus, the Son of the living God, eternal creator, came to earth to serve, not to be served. Jesus demonstrated a humble disposition by washing the feet of his disciples. James tells us to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humility and service should be a lifestyle, not an impersonation done by convenience once a week to show off to everybody. Now it says in these verses that she just happened to end up in the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz. That's in the New English Translation. In the Brenton Septuagint translation, it says she happened by chance to come upon a portion of land that belonged to this fella named Boaz. In the New King James, the word is happened. In the King James Version, good old William Shakespeare type language, she hap to light upon. Isn't that great? That's just flowery language thing. I mean, just she hap to light upon. What light in yon window breaks, or something like that, you know. <laughs> Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Haven't you always wondered that if she didn't know where he was, go find out? But that's not what it meant. What she was saying was, is how come you happen to be a member of this family, Romeo? Because I love you and my family and your family hate each other. I didn't know that until I was in high school, and I was forced to learn that play from my Latin teacher. And thank you very much. I'm really <laughs> loving this. Well, I learned a few things. The word in, in the King James uh, that translates hap or New King James happened, mikra, means by fate 
or by good fortune or by chance. In the New King James, it says she happened to light upon. It says she happened to come to or was come to the piece of property. And that word is kara, which means accidentally brought about. So by chance, by good fortune, by fate, she accidentally shows up gleaning in a field that belongs to Boaz. Now, how many of you buy that? (laughs) Guess what? The Hebrew language has no word for coincidence. This is from Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, who lived from 1905 to 1997. There is no Hebrew word for coincidence. Under Jewish law, Ruth could go to any field... Neither she or Naomi knew who the owner of the field was, nor the family connection, nor that the owner would show up that day. But the Lord God, Jehovah, led her to the field that belonged to a guy that was her relative, a relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. And he was led to be there at the right moment and was smitten by her when he got a first glance, love at first sight. God prepared that old boy, prepared her, the right place at the right time, and God orchestrated this appointment because he had a plan. You telling me God plays Cupid? Oh, baby, does he? (laughs) Now, Boaz walks up and he says to all of his workers, the Lord be with you. It's kind of like you and me today. Okay. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Ain't that just normal? It's the same thing here. The Lord be with you, and they automatically respond, the Lord bless you. That's the normal greeting. Would we have that kind of greeting in the United States? When leaders would walk up to the people and say, the Lord be with you, and the people would respond, the Lord bless you. Now, Herb and Cora McGarrity. She's full Irish. So she said, you know what you're supposed to say top of the morning to you? You know what you say after that? And I said, no. She says, and the rest of the day to you. <laughs> That's the Irish blessing. <laughs> top of the morning to you. And then you respond, and the rest of the day to you. And that's, that's what we have here. Now, I want to take a detour. God worked five days making a place for his finest creation. Man. Now I have a question for you. God blesses some men with wealth and prosperity so that they can bless others. Where is a working man going to work if there isn't a businessman with a business? The greatest responsibility of the wealthy is to provide work and benefits for their workers. Solomon said, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Proverbs 3.27 The more profit a businessman makes, the more that he can share with his workers. Thus, we should pray for God's blessing on those who are our bosses. God bless my good and decent boss, because the more he's blessed, the more he will bless me. But, we have a bunch of sinning bosses and administrators and politicians that are violating God's economy. Listen to me. They are God's enemies. You hear me? May God wake them up to pay up. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Now Boaz notices Ruth in verse 5 of chapter 2, and he asks about her because he is, in the English term, smitten. I never heard that term until I started watching British movies. (laughs) I, 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 I grew up in the streets of South Pomona. I just, you were bowled over. You know, you think, <laughs> man, she knocked me down. Woohoo, doggies. You know, but in the, in, but the, the right word would be smitten. That's a pretty good word. Her one guy one time says, every time I get next to her, my brain turns to mush and my mouth turns to blubber. <laughs> That's, that's a guy that has lost it, you know. Well, these guys knew her. Her reputation had preceded her. She was the daughter-in-law of the widow Naomi. She was from Moab. She was carrying 
and taking care of the widow Naomi. She had left her people to be with Naomi and she has become an Israelite. She left her land and became a member of the land she went to. That's the way you immigrate. She was willing to work. She wasn't above it. And she would do the stuff that the poorest of the poor did in order to make ends meet. Didn't bother her none. A princess in the land she came from willing to get her hands dirty. She sought permission. She was humble. She was a hard worker. They saw her digging in. She was supporting herself and her mother-in-law because they had nobody else. Now, the word Ruth, believe it or not, is a contraction of another compound word, Reuth, R-E-U-T-H. And it means the act of seeing. It means a sight or something worth seeing. In essence, it's a sight to behold. Uh-huh. Now, the guy, yeah, mighty fine. She was mighty fine. She was easy on the eye. Disney would make a princess cartoon thing of Ruth. Absolutely. She had grace. She had beauty. She had determination. She had faithfulness. She had strength. She had humility. And she had faith in a God that she never knew before growing up. The commentators surmise that Ruth was beautiful and that Naomi's instructions to her used her beauty and her charm to her best advantage. The word Ryu from a portion means a friend. Ruth was a friend to Naomi and by God's providence was able to turn Naomi's bitterness into sweetness and laughter. We find Naomi when she gets home. Don't, uh, don't refer to me as joyous anymore. I am bitter. I am lost. I am without. There is no trace that the bitter loss of her husband in Ruth was there only a trust in God and a desire to help Naomi and to be with people to whom she was now pledged. Thomas Hood wrote a poem about Ruth. And it's this portion of the poem that refers to Boaz getting his first glimpse of Ruth. She stood breast high amid the corn, clasped by golden light of morn, like the sweetheart of the sun, who many a glowing kiss had won. On her cheek an autumn flush deeply ripened such a blush. In the midst of brown was born, like red poppies grown with corn. Round her eyes were trestles fell, which were blackest none could tell. But long lashes veiled a light that had else been all too bright. And her hat with shady brim made her tressy forehead dim. Thus she stood amid the stalks. Praising God with sweetest looks. Sure, I said, heaven did not mean. Where I reap, thou shouldst but glean. Lay thy sheaf adown and come. Share my harvest and my home. Boaz spoke to Ruth and he says, I don't want you to go to anybody else's field. You come to this field. He asked her to stay with the ladies of the field and not to mingle with anyone else. And he gave her permission to receive the same refreshments that his workers received. In verses 11, 13, when she questioned his kindness, he praised her devotion to Naomi for joining the Israelites. And he prayed that Jehovah would reward her. She responded with humility and with gratitude. Little did Boaz know that God would answer his prayer with himself. Verses 14 through 16, Boaz personally guides Ruth to the dinner table and brings her himself an abundant meal. Then he instructs his men to let her glean anywhere. Do not prohibit her from going. Do not correct her. And then he says, and let fall handfuls of purpose. Verse 16. In Hebrew, it's the same word two times. And let fall. Handfuls of purpose. Same word. Two times. Two different translations. That phrase means he is telling his workers intentionally 
pull off some of the best of the best of the good stuff and give it to her in handfuls. And lastly, he tells his men workers, hands off. (laughs) Hands off, boys. Leave her alone. Verse 14. When she's eating with the same workers that are hired by Boaz, it says she was satisfied, but she kept some back. She did not pig out. This was not Golden Corral. (laughs) It says she ate until she was satisfied. I've had enough. I'm good, she said. And then she took what she still had to eat and saved it back. Why? For Naomi. In one field, nearly 200 reapers would work, and along with 200 gleaners would work. She was amongst 400 people minimum. A few took refreshment, parched corn. In the season of harvest, grains of wheat that are not fully dry and hard are roasted in a pan or in an iron skillet, and they are very palatable, an article of good food and tasty, and it's generally eaten along with bread or without bread. And this is what personally was given to her by Boaz. He prepared her refreshments. He brought her a nice glass of southern iced tea. (laughs) Because he was from South Judah, see, in the south there, south of Jerusalem. They have southern tea south of Jerusalem, see. Mm -hmm. You know what that means, don't you? Lots of sugar. Sweets for the sweet. Verses 17 and 18, Ruth brings everything back to Naomi. What she had gleaned, what had been given to her, was a week's supply of food in one day. Plus, the leftovers she had from the meal that Boaz gave her. Naomi praises God for guiding Ruth to the land of Boaz and says, He is our relative. He is our kinsman, redeemer. And she uses the term, our. She did not say to Ruth, my kinsman, redeemer. She said to Ruth, our kinsman, redeemer. You and me, because we're family. Verse 20 She tells Ruth to stay in those same fields till the end of the harvest season, which we understand now. He goes through barley and wheat harvest, and actually she's there for several months. In chapter 3, following Naomi's instructions, Ruth did what was customary of the Jews. She found Boaz asleep after a long, hard day's work, uncovered his feet, and lay down near him. He wakes up, and she says, Would you cover me with your blanket because... You are my kinsman. You know what that was? That was a marriage proposal. She proposed. What do they call that? There's a name for it. Yeah. Sadie Hawkins Day. It's when the girls have the right to go up and pick the boy. Say there, want to scratch my back and I'll scratch yours? (laughs) But she announces... She announces this in her customary, dignified manner. You're my kinsman redeemer. Boaz praises Ruth for her dignity, for her sterling character, and says to her, you know, a beautiful young girl like you could pick whoever she wanted. But she picked a man that was the same age as her father-in-law. He was not a young spry buck, but he was the right one. He could have married Naomi. And it wouldn't have been odd, except Naomi couldn't have children. Ruth could. And that's why God put them together. Boaz was a descendant of the tribe of Judah. Her pledge was this. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Your customs will be my customs. And I will die where you die. Chapter 3, Boaz promises to redeem the inheritance that had belonged to her father-in-law and take her as his wife, which is the custom. If you're going to get the land, you got to get the girl. And when she has children, the land belongs to them, not to your kids. And that's where we find the next statement in chapter 4. 
Now, it's interesting. It's still kind of dark. And he says, uh, take this cloth that you have, spread it out. And he gives her two and a half gallons of grain, which is enough for about six weeks of food. The Targum says that this six measures that he gave to her is a spirit of prophecy that from her would descend six righteous men. David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the Messiah. This was prophetic as far as the Jewish people are concerned who teach the Torah and the Old Testament. Each one of those measures was a benediction of God's love, grace, and mercy to this pure girl who claimed by faith the people and the God of Naomi. So chapter 4, we find Boaz going to town. And he goes to the gate where all the judges are. And it says that he knew that there was somebody that was actually a closer relative than he was. And he kind of sitting out there waiting for this guy to show up. And the King James says, Ho, such a one. I don't get your attention. <laughs> you got me? Yeah, you, come here. And Boaz is somebody. I mean, if the mayor of the town came up to you and said, Hey, come over here, you. Would you come over here, you? <laughs> Well, he comes over and he says, hey, there's this piece of land that belongs to Naomi. I want you to buy it. Oh, good. Yeah, look, I need some more acreage. you got to marry Ruth, the Moabitess. What? Moabitess? They're our enemy. Not only would I be marrying a girl that's the enemy of my people, but I have to share my inheritance with her and her children that I have by her? No. Thank you. Yeah. So it says he took off his shoe. Yeah. Now, how many of you? have read this and thought, what on earth are they talking about? <laughs> he took off his shoe and gave it to Boaz. God said to Abraham, wherever you walk, I'll give you the land. Genesis 13. God said to Moses in Deuteronomy 11, and he said to Joshua the same thing in Joshua chapter 1. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. Past tense. Fixed property was taken possession by the treading upon its soil and hence taking off the shoe and handing it over to another was a symbol of the transfer of the possession of your right of ownership. So he is saying, Boaz, here's my shoe. The land's yours. Wherever you walk belongs to you. What I could have had, you have. So Boaz buys the land. The city elders certify it. They sign off on it, and then he says, get ready for a wedding. He marries Ruth, and together they have a son whose name is Obed, who becomes the grandfather of King David. It's interesting that they chose the word Obed because it means serving, one who serves. And it is a testimony to Ruth. It's a testimony to her sterling character to be a servant. It's a testimony to those who are leaders to be servants of others. The story of Ruth reminds Christians of their status before God. We're his covenant people because of the sacrifice of our kinsman redeemer. We were lost in sin, but he has redeemed us through his death. Thus, we too should exemplify God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Jesus has abolished all the barriers that separated us. Through him, salvation is av available to all. Amen. Gentiles can enter into the kingdom of God as well as any Jew. Amen. The message that comes out of the book of Ruth, this little short story, one of the greatest love stories in all of literature, is the story of the man who became a kinsman redeemer. And it's a picture of the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who became kin with us, who took upon himself the form of flesh that he might save us and redeem us to himself. He has done that because he loves us. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Great things he has done. Amen. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the rain fall softly on your fields and the sun shine warmly on your face. <laughs>